In this episode of Mind Pump, uh, we wanted to talk all about nutrition uh, in regards to fat loss, muscle building, nutrition for performance and athletes. And so we brought on our good friend, Jason Phillips. He's actually one of our favorite people to talk about uh, when it comes to nutrition and macros. He's the founder of the Nutritional Coaching Institute. This dude really knows his stuff. His certification course is one of the best for online uh, fitness coaches that we found ever. Um, and this guy communicates it very, very well. He knows because of his experience working with lots of people. Now, uh, as when he was younger, he himself suffered from body image issues like anorexia, recovered. Um, and then really that drove him to really learn how to apply nutrition the right way. And he personally has worked with uh, big time athletes, UFC fighters, WWE wrestlers, fitness celebrities, and a lot of everyday people. And of course, I told you, he uh, is the founder of NCI. They are what we consider to be one of the premier online nutrition court coaching courses that you can find anywhere. Um, now, uh, in this episode, we talked about a few different things. We talked about refeeding, you know, what that means, yo yo dieting, uh, fat hyperplasia. This is when you actually add fat cells. We talked about the value and uh, the, the bad side of cheat meals. We talked about training fighters, uh, fat versus carbs. You know, there's two main ways people like to diet, either lowering fat or lowering carbs. We talked about the pluses and minuses there. Talk about protein. Uh, when is it appropriate to lower protein? Is high protein always a good thing? Uh, ideal carb sources. We talked about that. We mentioned even ideal protein sources. So we think you're going to love this episode. Now, I also want to let you know that March 21st of this year, Mind Pump headquarters will be hosting a level one nutrition coaching specialist certification from NCI. So it's going to be here um, in our headquarters. And you're going to love this. Uh, so before we started the episode, we were talking to Jason and we convinced him to give us a phenomenal discounted hookup for Mind Pump listeners only. Um, and we went back and forth, and I think we might have pushed him a little bit, but uh, we got what we wanted. So check this out. If you go to ncimindpump.com, you're going to get a full 70% off all of the certifications. Some massive, massive discount. Again, if you're a fitness trainer, a coach, especially if you work with people online, we find this certification to be one of the most valuable ones you can get for nutrition. Now, before the episode starts, uh, I also want to let you know that MAPS HIT is 50% off. Now, HIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training. That's H-I-I-T. Now, this style of training has had a lot of press in the last 10 years because studies show HIT style training to burn more body fat in shorter periods of time. So they'll have studies that'll compare like a 20-minute HIT session to a 60-minute traditional workout session, and the HIT workout will burn as much or more body fat. So it's pretty crazy. It got popular really, really fast. Now, unfortunately, when things get popular in the fitness space, you start to get a lot of bad information as well. So there's a lot of HIT workouts out there that are terrible, terribly written, programmed, high risks of injury. Uh, the workouts aren't programmed with you know trying to preserve muscle as one of the number one goals. So we set out to create a HIT program that was done the right way. We wrote MAPS HIT. So this is a phenomenal workout. It utilizes the concept of high intensity interval training, but it's done the right way. We've included three levels in this program. So you can be a beginner, intermediate, or advanced. Uh, of course, every exercise is shown on video. We tell you how to do it the right way. We, pro we write everything out in a blueprint for you. So you get everything that you need to follow the most effective hit style workout you'll find anywhere for maximum fat loss in the shortest period of time. And that program's 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapshit.com. That's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T.com and use the code HIT50. That's H-I-I-T-5-0, no space, for the discount. What do you want to get into today? What do you want to talk about? Well, I was thinking we covered that topic up there, how yeah. to lose how to, how to to lose fat and build muscle. I think uh, most of the questions we get surrounding nutrition are around those two things right there. And maybe we can kind of break down how somebody can figure this out for themselves. You know, everything from macros, calories, and- Programming. Programming, you know, low carb versus low fat. You know, what, what are the, 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 
the differences between the two, that kind of stuff. Would you say this is one of the number one things you get asked or what? I definitely think so. I mean, I think it's uh, fat loss is, I think it's a multi-billion dollar industry for a reason, yeah. right? I mean, there's, I mean, when you look at the stats, um, I, I actually had them on like a webinar I did recently. It was like a $6 billion uh, or th there's like 6 billion overweight people mm -hmm. in the world. And then there's like a, like some several million um, that are classified as obese. So, I mean, like when we look at stats in the country, it's fucking Yeah, absurd. in the, in the U U.S., I think um, we've already hit a majority overweight and 40% obese. So, yeah. you're looking at almost half of the whole country is considered obese. Yeah, I shared that graph that by 2030, they predict that if we stay on the same trend, that over 50% will be considered obese. Yeah. Now, first thing I'd like to maybe uh, tackle with this, Jason, is the whole, you know, changing you know going losing fat and building muscle at the same mm -hmm. time right this is like the super goal like the ultimate goal right um how possible is this what does this look like what is a diet that does this how many like? people ha do you know that have, have done this so i mean i before so i know we're gonna get flamed right and and there's gonna be all the <laughs> there's gonna be all the marketers in the world that are gonna come to me and they're gonna be like jason's wrong but um I, you know if you can show me peer-reviewed studies that i'm wrong I'll, I'll gladly admit that i am but you know just simple science to lose weight or to lose body fat, you need to be in a calorie deficit to, to gain lean tissue. You need to be in a calorie surplus. I mean, I mean, physiology hasn't changed. Um, the only exception that I, I really ever see to the rule is a really low training age. Um, or, and I'll even tack onto that, like a completely like off the wall training stimulus. So like a low training age in a new stimulus. So, um, like somebody that is an experienced bodybuilder or they've done like hypertrophy style or, you know, global gym style training for, for quite some time. Right. And all of a sudden they go to CrossFit, like the volume completely changes, like the, the metabolic stimulus changes. Like I've actually seen some recomp there. Well, they're getting the same benefits that we talk about a lot on the show. And the, the debate or the argument that I'd have with you is that where I think you're alluding to right now is kind of that, 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 those beginner lucky results yeah. that everybody kind of gets. The like, newbie gains. You, you, exactly. The newbie yeah. gains. You could be, if you come in, you've never really weight trained before in your life and you come in the gym and you, and your goal too is fat loss. So you're, so let's say your main goal, I want to lose 30 pounds of fat, but your, your, you know, method of doing so you, you've listened to mind pump, you know, that building muscle or lifting weights is the most ideal way. So you start lifting weights. Uh, what happens a lot of times, even in a caloric deficit, is because this person's never touched any weights, they also build a little bit of muscle yeah, along the I way. I think you have to have a really, really loud muscle building signal and a very, very responsive adaptation process at the same time. And so that usually happens with beginners uh, with a lot of novelty, right? So new, new stimulus and or hormonal stimulus like uh, anabolic steroids. Otherwise, it's really hard because building muscle is hard to begin with. Try building muscle uh, while eating low enough calories to also lose body fat. It's just it seems to be kind of competing. So I don't, I don't want to use the word like optimized, but like it, like what you just described, I also think comes back to um, I would say like for a client having them at like a homeostatic balance or, or having them at homeostasis, right? And I think that. Uh, when we look at this, we look at fat loss, we look at muscle building in general, so many people are already doing it from a compromised state, right? Like think of all the different things they've tried, like all on and all the potential metabolic adaptations from the things that they've tried. So they've, they've tried keto, they've tried carnivore, they've tried fasting and, and they've, they've gone like extreme calorie deficit, extreme calorie deficit, extreme calorie deficit. And now, um, you know, even if they got on like an appropriate macro plan, they're so metabolically adapted, like they're not going to adapt the same way as somebody who has tried nothing, who has no hormonal issues, has no uh, internal physiological issues, right? They're, they're working closer from homeostatic balance and therefore the results are going to happen and happen faster. But, you know, to, to your to point, Sal, like I used to get, I was so hated on in the CrossFit world in the beginning uh, before I got loved by the CrossFit world, right? <laughs> but I was, I was one of the ones that came in in the beginning and I said, fuck paleo. And I was like, this is ridiculous that you guys think paleo is actually going to work long term in this extreme setting. Or it's ideal, right? Yeah. It's just because, it's, so it works, not, it's not just because it works for some people. Doesn't well, but it means, didn't work. And yeah. that's the like, so what Sal's saying is, is 100% true. Like people were seeing results despite what they were doing, not because of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, when you go in the CrossFit gym and the first time I went to a CrossFit gym, I had never barbell snatched. I had never clean and jerked. 
right? I'd never front squatted. Like I didn't even have the fucking mobility to get in a front rack. And so sure, like, you know, two and a half, three months in, I can front squat 400 pounds because I could back squat 500 at that time, right? So like ratio wise, it worked out. I could all of a sudden power clean, AKA reverse curl, you know, 255. (laughs) I could somehow heave 150 pounds over my head and try to, you know, overhead squat it. And those weren't because of anything I was doing nutrition wise or recovery wise or performance wise. That's just exposure to the movements. So when I used to give seminars, I would say you could achieve the same results in your first eight to nine months of CrossFit on paleo, on fasting, on keto, on high carb, on low carb. But I would also go so far as to say you could achieve the same results on 500 calories or 5,000 calories. And, and I always reference that as a neurological adaptation phase. You're just creating neurological adaptations. You're learning the movements, right? You're, it's all brain. It's all connection in your brain. But at some point, you have to begin physically adapting. And when you start physically adapting, you require fuel and recovery. Like you have to have the proper fuel substrates for the stimulus that you're providing to your body. Well, when you're trying to add tissue, that requires uh, a certain amount of energy. Absolutely. Now, I'll argue that neurological adaptations also require energy, but not nearly exactly. to the same yeah. extent. Not yeah. nearly I don't think you extent. could go in with zero calories, but I, I think that your average, un, I mean, we live in an obese world, right? right? So your average analogy, detrained I person, I, I really, like, I, I see people that don't eat until dinner and they're like, I'm fucking PRing everything. And, and they would be like, it, it's got to be paleo. Well, no, actually you started eating whole foods. Like you have less inflammation and you have exposure to new movements. Yeah. And you just started working out. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. So let's say someone says, I want to build muscle and burn body fat. And you're saying, look, under most circumstances, in most situations, probably not going to happen. It's not going to happen at the same time. What should they focus on first? If I want to lose fat and build muscle, which one should I aim for first? So I'm a, I'm a big believer in like your body's most efficient in like the 8% to 12% body fat range. Right. So if you're, if you're coming to me and you're shredded and you're 6%, right. Mm -hmm. A, I hope you don't want to lose fat, but listen, like anyone that heard our first podcast, I started as anorexic, so I get it. Um, you know, but like your average person that's coming to you, if if they're in that like eight to 12% and they're actually like tracking macros, I'd say, hey, like assuming you don't want to look a certain way on a beach or or you don't have any physical things coming up, cool, like we could jump into that. Um, most people are going to be outside of that scope. They're going to be in the 13, 14, 15, probably 20% and higher. I'm going to advise that you actually get healthy um, and get your body fat under control and, you know, carrying around excess body fat, there's a host of health issues coming with that, right? Um, I mean, increased inflammation, then we start looking at the quality of your sleep, then we look at gut health, and, and then we just start going down the rabbit hole of all the things that that's causing in the body. So now I know what that looks like for me. I'm curious to what, how you do it. So I'll share how I would do that because I agree. It's like the first week I'm having them track all their foods yep. and I can see what it looks like. And so, and I actually don't reduce calories, right? right. I yeah. think a lot I, of people I, think you have you're, to be careful not to, right. Fact. Especially when you start getting rid of shitty food, that's, yes. okay, that's super calorie dense. Like now I want to make sure I replace it with a food that is, you know, uh, also nutritious, but then I know that that's probably going to be a lot less calories too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, my goal is actually to kind of keep them the same, uh, calorically and just start to make healthier, better choices. It's going to serve their body more health wise. I, I think we have to look at it too from a, so one of the things we were talking about off the air before we started is I, I always live inside of nutritional periodization. Like that's my big thing. And I think 99.9% of people that come to me want to lose fat first, but a lot of people have done such extreme things that they've almost, uh, I don't want to say this in like the wrong way, but I want to say in a way that it comes across, they've, they've almost lost the right to lose fat. Mm. Um, they've become so metabolically adapted. They, their mental issues with food, like their relationship with food, the way that they handle dieting, the process in general, if I allow them to undertake those things, I'm only going to do them more harm than good. Now, mm. you know, Sal, to go to your point, we could look at the physique and we could say, hey, maybe it is proper for them to lose fat first and then gain muscle. But if I if I get to know the person and I see where this is going and I know I'm setting them up for disaster, I can't ethically as a coach do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I talk in the certifications, I talk that my my results with a client are defined 10 years from now, not 10 weeks from now. Mm. And if I didn't give you the tools to be successful for the next decade, I failed you as a coach. And so really like the, the legacy and, and 
everything of Jason Phillips will be written 10 years from now. It won't be written in 10 weeks or, mm. or 10 months, right? It's yeah. going to be written in 10 years. Did I have the impact on the industry that I want to have? And did I have the impact on the 10,000 people that I've helped? Did I really actually help them or did I give them a Band-Aid like the rest of the assholes in the industry? What are, what are some of those questions that you're going to ask that, that client coming in first in terms of like, being able to evaluate what needs to be addressed and finding that homeostasis and sure. like where you can even get there. Sure. So, I mean, I think everybody in our space looks at nutrition and training in general, purely physical. Um, and I, I always say that the physical follows the physiological, right? So you're not going to create physical change without physiology being super dialed in. Um, and so I love to look at things like biofeedback, right? I mean, we could start with just a simple list of questions. How's your sleep? How's your energy? How's your mood? How's your focus? How's your sex drive? Um, and, and we could, we could start there. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, you're talking to a, a male, he's 27, he's got no sex drive. Mm -hmm. Like clearly that's a problem. You know, that's a sign testosterone levels are probably low. Like we can't 100% create correlation, but we can draw some clinical correlation mm -hmm. and at least go down the rabbit hole of investigating testosterone. Mm -hmm. And we all know if testosterone levels are subadequate, well, good luck losing fat and good luck gaining right. muscle. And right? then you also can too probably assume that he's, he may be on the end of not getting very good quality sleep also because yeah. we know how much that affects that. Or it could just like, you know, let's let's be honest, as a 27-year-old male, if your testosterone levels are, are subadequate, you know, or, or suboptimal, um, something happened, right? Either you've got a pituitary issue, either you were born like hypogonadal or you did something to, to trigger like hypogonadism. Yeah. Right. And, and so now I need to do like a lifestyle investigation. Is there anorexia in your past? Is there depression in your past? Is there overtraining in your past? Is there a lack of sleep? Are you abusing your body? Are you constantly on alcohol and drugs? Like, what are the things that you didn't put in your intake that you actually need to tell me so that we can have a real working relationship? Like, I'm not here to judge. You want to do drugs? Dope. Like, do drugs. Like, that's on you. I'm not going to recommend it. I don't think it's great. Like, but I need to want, know it. But I need to fucking know. Right. If I'm going to put together a diet and it's a It's like program when you worked with competitors. Yeah. If they were on steroids, you got to fucking know they're on steroids. <laughs> yeah. Like it kind of changes how you prescribe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. And, and I, how important are these conversations in, in training successful or working with clients successfully? Because I noticed th you, through the people that you coach, the trainers that take your courses, they come out uh, and they place more of an emphasis on communicating these things. Mm -hmm than other courses. How important do you think that is versus the, what's your goal? Let's find what your metabolic rate is. Here's your calories. Let's figure out proteins, fats, carbs, what works best for you. How important is the other stuff that you were just talking about? I would say it's probably the most important. I mean, listen, when, when looking at fat loss and muscle gain, the diet itself is the most important. Like right. you can't implement a shitty diet and expect results. You also can't have a perfect diet and not implement it and expect results. Right. And, and unfortunately what I saw, like when I came to the space was there's a lot of people not getting results, but there was a lot of really intelligent people in the world. Like a lot of really good, like, you know, they, they knew biology, they knew metabolism, they knew physiology, they knew strength training, yet their clients still weren't getting results. And so like what you referenced, like the, the coaches that go through our stuff, I teach what I call a connection based model. And I came in and I was like, man, like it's, it has nothing to do with the fact that your macros are wrong. Cause when's the last time you actually fucking hit them? Mm. Right. And they're like, oh, it's probably been a week or two. Cause you know, stress or I stress eight or I missed my macros or I got caught out and it's like, cool. So a really good coach doesn't just prescribe macros. A really good coach has to understand these things. And, and it all goes back to like, okay, well, what's first, do we lose fat or do we build muscle? Well, are you even in the lifestyle position to start losing fat? Mm -hmm. Like, do you know what it takes to to get to super low levels of body fat? I think a lot of people underestimate. You know, there's so much sexy marketing right yeah. now around. Uh, and, and actually, I, I saw a really good post on on Instagram yesterday. I forget who it was. It was like Jeremy Mullins or something. And he he talked like he got this dude who was pretty overweight. I mean, he's at least two sixty, two seventy, and he got him shredded to the bone. And he was like, "This shit's hard." Like anybody that tells you it's not is completely full of shit. And, and I think that a lot of people have to be ready for a journey where there is some sacrifice mm -hmm. and, and there is. But to get there can take a while. Like absolutely. I, I, I noticed that I'd say probably eight or nine out of 10 clients that I'd work with the easier strategy. And when I say easier, I mean that the strategy that was most successful. Okay. 
the most successful strategy was rather than restricting food was to actually add food. Oh, so they'd come see sure. me and I'd say, "Okay, you're not eating vegetables. Let's have you start eating more vegetables." Okay, your protein intake is low. Don't change anything else about a di- about your diet, but I want you to hit this protein goal. Mm-hmm. And then through that, they would naturally change the other parts of their diet as yeah. well. Well, by proxy, right? Like, what are you doing? You're increasing satiety, and now all of a sudden they mm-hmm. want less of the shit. And so, you know, it makes sense. And that all goes back to you're a good coach, right? Like, you're you. We could all sit here and like we're all of the same level of intelligence, and like we all see the the industry at like the same way we all understand how to build a right, like the right diet and like the proper diet. And we could all come to that same conclusion, but the reason our clients are successful isn't because we came to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. It's what you just said. It's, it's how do you walk them there? Right. I mean, I, I always say, um, in physique transformation, that it's like a Mount Everest analogy, Mm -hmm. right? The pinnacle of Everest is, is macros straight. Like it has to be sure. Quantity matters. The end, anybody that says otherwise completely full of shit. Right. Right. Like, that doesn't mean you can't that get I, around it. Yeah, you just you can't, right? Like if you're trying to achieve optimal physique transformation, you damn well better have like you better know what your quantity of intake is. Mm-hmm. The end. That being said, like when you look at Mount Everest in the real world, like you don't go to the pinnacle of Mount Everest and fucking stay there. And I don't really believe that every single person should be tracking macros the rest of their life or should be like held to that extreme the rest of their life. And so like what happens when you go summit Everest? You get a Sherpa. They lead you up. And they also fucking lead you down, right? There's checkpoints on the way up. And when you get there, cool. Like you take your picture, you plant your flag, you do the damn thing, but they're not like, hey, motherfucker, see you later, right? (laughs) There's like, there's a way down from this that's not going to kill you. Hmm. And I think so many coaches are getting people, they're like, well, I'm going to live at the pinnacle. Uh, I'm going to just talk about the pinnacle. I'm going to talk about quantity control. And now I'm going to get sexy because the industry is changing and I'm going to talk about quality too but I'm still going to live inside this pinnacle. Mm. And what most people need is they need the journey to that pinnacle. They need to experience the pinnacle. And then they also need to experience the journey down. And there might be multiple journeys inside of this fat loss and muscle gain kind of like paradigm that we're talking about. And that's, and that's lifelong. That's you're talking about lifelong success within this rather than short term intense. Well, I I think there's an application to short term too. I think that if, you know, we could use physique competition, but we could use any kind of fat loss. I think that um, I'm a big believer. Every dose of stress requires a dose of recovery. And if you're putting somebody in a prolonged calorie deficit, 10, 12, 18 weeks, that's a large dose of stress. There has to be a large dose of recovery that comes on the back end of that. And so, you know, I talk about a periodized model, that large dose of stress, we could call that season or active pursuit of goals. You have to bring yourself back to a homeostatic balance, right? Like if we did blood work after an 18 week diet, we're going to see suboptimal thyroid function right? It might be subclinical. It might not be clinically deficient, but we are absolutely going to see a change. We're going to see changes in the HPA axis. So in that postseason phase, we need to bring people back to a homeostatic balance. Now, what are your next set of goals, right? We can have an off season. We can talk about building muscle. We can talk about whatever. And then whatever that next pursuit is, we can jump into that active pursuit of goals. Now, now what does that look like? You did 10 mm-hmm. weeks of, of being in a calorie deficit. Mm-hmm. You want to come out of it. You just come out of it. I think that there's two really big schools of thought right now and, and they're clashing hard. Oh, and, really? And I'm not, uh, I'm not taking sides, man. Cause I, 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 uh, well, I, tell us, I want to hear I this. go back to the individual. Well, well you know, side. there's, there's the reverse <laughs> we'll diets of the world, okay. right? Where it's like, Hey, you know, and it's a pretty standard protocol, right? Come out of your diet, add 20 ish percent calories and then add small increments. Mm-hmm. And then there's, um, there's the recovery diet crowd where it's like, you know, fuck that, that's too slow. Um, You're spending way too much time, suboptimal hormones, suboptimal thyroid. You need to add a significant amount of calories. You need to get over the mental shit of looking in the mirror and and you just need to accept the fact that you're gonna add some body fat pretty quickly and uh, and get it back up. Now, there's some people that are well equipped with that. And from physiology, I can can understand. Sure, I can make the case for both people. Yeah, I I, I think it would depend on the person. It has to depend on the individual. That's why I said I'm not going to take sides. The wrong wrong person on either side, like for example, the slow backing out, right? The wrong person uh, for that would be the person that's obsessed with their body. They're so obsessed with looking a certain way and they're afraid. They're afraid to get out of the super shredded condition. That could be a problem in the the reverse diet. And I I would argue that I... I chose one way out of uh, bodybuilding. I would not guide another client the same way I did. How did that's you because choose? I had the discipline. Because I surged right back. So mm-hmm. I, 
I gave myself a good solid week of very high calorie yep. post being on being deprived for so right. long because I, I knew I needed it. But I also had the mental awareness and discipline to know what the fuck I was doing and then go switch back yeah. down to a more balanced, closer to where my, car- yeah. my calorie maintenance yeah, currently was. The wrong person to go into the other option, which is the strong recovery, mm-hmm. would be the person that has a tendency to binge, mm. that has a tendency to just go off the rails where it's on or off type of deal. Now, there are studies that show that really, really high amounts of calories post being in a calorie deficit in- improves or increases your body's ability to store body fat as if your body is trying yes. to capture yep. or improve its ability to capture fat. And you know, it's funny in bodybuilding for, this is something that's happened for as long as I can remember, bodybuilders that would diet and bulk, diet and bulk, diet and bulk, they started to come into shows- Softer and softer. Not yes. It was harder and harder to get lean. And it may be because they were adding fat cells each yeah, time they did Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. It becomes hyperplasia, mm-hmm. right? Like it's it, you're no longer just getting bigger fat cells; you're getting more fat cells. Yeah. Because of this yo-yo, I remember. Um, do you guys remember Scott Abel? Yep. Like for, okay, so yeah, Scott yeah. Abel, like one of the he used to say, like you can starve yourself, and like it's one of the worst things you can do. But the single worst thing you can do is yo-yo diet. Mm. He's like that will lead to more long-term disaster. And and when he said it, I didn't understand context. Like I mean, I was young in the game, but. I always thought he was pretty ahead of the body bo- like bodybuilding world with his knowledge. And so I studied a lot of his stuff. And um, as I've really understood more and like exactly like you were talking about, adding more fat cells, it I always go back to that statement yeah. from him. And, if you, and really, if you want to mimic evolution, yeah, I'm sure humans went through periods of feast and famine, but it wasn't famine that was, you know, 12 weeks and then feast that was 12 weeks. Well, it wasn't if, famine and then feast for like two days, like extreme and then, and then sustained. That's either. it. It was probably like one day of, Oh, yeah. we gotta, we gotta hunt. Let's eat all this food. So they overfed for a day or two and then they were right back which, down. To which normal. by the way, when we look at physiology, it's actually works, a good thing. It works right? great. That like, way. Yeah. When, like when we start looking at refeeds or periodic overfeeding or, or periodic diet breaks, mm. that shit actually works. The problem and, is and now so, we live in a world where it's very easy to go find that feast. That's the very it. Next day again. Yeah. And this <laughs> is the reason why for most clients, I never recommended they'd come out of a calorie deficit all at once. Yeah. Right. It mm-hmm. was mainly because of the psychological piece because you're already in a deficit. You start to come out. As soon as you start eating extra calories, your appetite gets ramped the hell yep. up. You already feel like you've been restricting yourself. So psychologically speaking, you feel like the the chains are off of you. Mm. And then you just go overboard. And then it's this heavy <laughs> boulder going down a hill. It's very, very now, hard Now, where to slow do you down. stand, Jason, on cheat meals? <laughs> like, define a cheat meal. Right, it, because like, I have a polyamorous yeah. diet. <laughs> <laughs> there is no cheating. I don't define it. Yeah. Uh, like I, I don't. I, I think that the industry connotation of a cheat meal is like, hey, uh, on Sunday night you're gonna go just completely gorge yourself and eat whatever you want. And I just think that's irresponsible right. to ever tell a client like, hey, there's there's no limitations and and you can do whatever you want. And I think that if you're if you're setting someone else if you're setting someone up for that. Like you're irresponsible with the rest of your approach. Honestly, the emphasis on the cheat meal is is indifferent. It's it's what you're doing the other six and a half days that completely needs to be changed. Uh, like I'll, I'll reference Scott again, right? He had he had the, a diet called the cycle diet, and it was basically starve your ass off for six days and <laughs> literally eat whatever you want for a day. Like, and he would uh, there would he had like a forum, and I was like active on it, and he would like have. Uh, like crazy people like gaining like 18 pounds in a day. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and so I did the diet and uh, like, so you know what it takes to get to like shredded glute status. I yeah. walked around with shredded glutes <laughs> like day to day. Like I was fucking peeled. Um, I had just no, scratching uh, chairs with uh, your <laughs> shredded glutes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I had no sex drive and, and it was extra, like the, the emotional part was what fucked me up. Yeah. I didn't care about training anymore. I really had no interest in life. Yeah. All I thought about was like, man, what am I going to eat on Sunday? That's just it, man. It's a psychological well, piece because once you, when you when you have an all out day and you, you ever observe, of course you have, you've trained, you've worked with tons of clients. When you observe somebody who's going through that period of like, like, oh, it's an all out day, I can eat yeah. whatever I want. Yeah. The binge mentality is not about the food, actually, right. not at all. You're not even the, enjo- the behavior exactly. of what that promotes. You're not even en- you're not even enjoying the food. You're, yeah, you're, that's where I'm getting at with it. It's about the food. It's go- it hasn't even gotten your mouth yet. That's and the, that's, that's where that's I was what trying to get. Like, like when you say like define a cheat meal. Like, do I think that the act of allowing somebody to eat without any sort of mindfulness or restriction is a bad thing inherently? I don't. Like, I honestly right. I don't think it's the end of the world. Um, in terms I, of flexibility. I, but I, I think if somebody's really desiring that, 
you need to take a step back and well, look at like what is the overall protocol that you're giving them that's that's asking for that. Now, are you asking me in a competition prep setting or are you asking me in like real life setting? Because if it's sure, a comp prep depend. setting, listen, you're the one that decided to get on a stage in very little clothing and you need to look a certain way. And and by the way, you're telling the world that I'm the one doing your diet. So <laughs> no <I'm> sorry, <laughs> you're going to be a little bit restricted. <laughs> but if, if you're just here and you're saying, I want to lose some weight and this is a lifelong thing and, and we're genuinely trying to create transformation. And again, I'll reference the 10 years versus 10 weeks. Like if I'm setting you up to where you feel like you need that, mm. I'm fucking up, mm -hmm. not mm. you. Well, mm. it, it, the name itself, cheat day, implies you're 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 doing something Deviation, wrong. Deviation. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like it's, but like to your point, uh, do I think that uh, having a, sur a surplus day of calories? Is, no, it's a, actually a great and it smart great. thing to do. Yeah. yeah, and I do that with any clients that I have in a caloric deficit, especially when I'm running them on a caloric deficit for weeks at a time. I will insert a, a high calorie day. I'll say, hey, Friday, you know, because we've been running now for four days in a row of, you know, 1700 calories, I want you to have between 22 and 2500 calories. So, and I'll give that as a, as a goal, you know? I, I think I'm, and I'm super neurotic, like when I work with clients and I only work with a handful of clients anymore. I'll literally when they're six to eight weeks out from whatever their peak is, like if it's a, a physique show or like, dude, I'm looking at pictures and weight every day mm -hmm. and I'm calling these audibles, like what you were just describing. Like I'm looking and I'm like, all right, you're a little flat. We can push a little harder. And like, so I'm working with a WWE guy right now. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I can't say who, cause what I'm going to tell you, but like for the first time, it looks like he's going to make the main card on WrestleMania, uh, which cool. is a huge accomplishment yeah, for him. Right. Cool. I was just going to say grave digger, but that's uh, <laughs> the Undertaker. monster trucks. <laughs> the Undertaker. I, uh, I did Undertaker. work with, his, yes. I did work with his wife this year. Oh, no way. Yeah. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, I love that guy. Um, so, but no, like, so it looks like he's actually Bailey from WWE lives up here. Oh, uh, yeah. And we were going to connect later today. I just started working with her. Oh, well, uh, very yeah. cool. But uh, yeah, like, I, I mean, but like with him, same deal. Like as it gets closer, we're looking every day and I'm mm -hmm. calling that audible, right? But it, I mean, that's such a, it's such a neuroses. And, and so then we got to take a step back and it's like, all right, what is the personality of this individual that's taking on this endeavor? Well, here along those lines, um, I think this is a good question to ask. And we all, we know that one thing that all diets that cause you to lose weight have in common is that they're all lower calories uh, than you're burning. That's, yes. not, that's what they all have to be regardless. What the, now, how the, there's a, there's always been this debate. It's been around for a long time. What's better for fat loss, low carb or low fat? Now, both same calories and all that stuff, ultimately up to the individual. My question is this, how do you determine or how do you help the client determine if they're doing if they're going to do better with a lower calorie low fat mm -hmm. diet versus a low low carb uh, low calorie diet. So there's a lot to be considered here. And I think this is where, in my opinion, the industry is still fucking up. But from a science perspective, right? Peer reviewed research, it says assuming calories are controlled for properly and assuming proteins controlled for properly, the ratio of carbs to fat is indifferent when it comes to fat. Doesn't loss. matter. Like, like that's what science tells us. On now, a physiological level, doesn't matter. Correct. Now, that's assuming, and, and I have to look at like what the control variables were and assume like there's no adaptations, there's no mm -hmm. histories. Like I don't know what the training stressor or life stressor was, but um, that to me is what's overlooked is like, we're, we're looking so myopically at the diet that we're now taking out all the other things that go into building a diet. What is life stress like? What is previous dietary attempts and stressors look like? What is your training stimulus? Um, you know, we could look at just a, a, an everyday person um, and draw two extreme examples. We could have a stay at home house mom, very low stress, right? She doesn't even have kids, stay at home wife. And, and she's like, I just get to chill. I, I get to go run up my Cresma, or my, my husband's credit card. Um, and, and life is fucking gold, right? Zero stress. Um, she would be just fine on a low carb diet, mm. right? There's, there's no need for that carbohydrate. There's no, uh, extreme sympathetic response. She's probably not doing super intense weight training. And, and even if she is that dose of intensity, that, that sympathetic response that you're going to get, it's really, uh, not that it's like negligible in the grand scheme of things. Now we look at that completely different and we say, okay, that same person is a fortune 500 CEO. And, and they go to work every day and, and they're in the fucking fire from six in the morning until 11 PM. And they're putting out fires and they're responsible for all sorts of money. And, uh, there's, they're basically living in their sympathetic nervous system all day. Well, I would argue they should be a slightly higher carbohydrate mm -hmm. diet, right? Cause what's going to happen? Like we know, and, and this goes back to when, uh, I'm going to say the words carb backloading, but like when that whole thing was completely bastardized, right? And, and the whole premise of it was, well, you wake up with elevated cortisol and elevated growth hormone. And so if you don't eat carbohydrates and you don't create an insulin spike, 
you're going to keep carbohydrates or you're going to keep that cortisol high, mm -hmm. right? Cortisol is a catabolic hormone. It's non-selective. So it will break down some fat tissue mm -hmm. in conjunction with muscle tissue. Um, well, so if you eat your protein, it'll offset that, that muscle breakdown. And now all of a sudden you've got this environment for fat loss. Like that was the premise of it. But if we look at that and we apply it to this like super high, like sympathetic nervous system state and cortisol is already through the roof and, and now you're not having any carbs to create that insulin spike to potentially shut off that cortisol in the morning. Then you walk in an environment, cortisol continues to shoot up all day. Then you go in a training environment, you train with an extreme amount of stress, right? And, and you go like balls to the wall, you fucking do CrossFit or some stupid shit, right? All of a sudden, now you're creating an environment where if you don't have carbohydrates, you are asking, even in an adequate caloric state, to start messing with the HPA axis. Because you don't have, because carbohydrates will raise insulin a little bit, yep. and that insulin is inversely related or with, with cortisol, yes. right? So insulin goes up, cortisol goes down. Yes. So if you're a high, so what you're saying is you have clients that want to burn body fat, the high stress ones typically do better with more carbs. The Correct. low stress ones typically do better uh, with low carb. I, yeah. I, I also think there's value too to um, assessing uh, stool, hair, hormones, sure. and then knowing what foods correlate with that the most. Yeah. Right? What, does that, and, what does that come back to though? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. So it's, stress. Right, right. And, and, or, and or knowing that, okay, I know that this person, based off of these things that I'm getting from feedback from them, may be deficient and I know that this is a fat. I need to get more fat in their mm -hmm. diet. So that person, I would definitely not recommend a lower fat, higher carbohydrate diet because of those reasons. So I think that gets brought into account also, right? Yeah, yeah. and sometimes too, you know, I've noticed this and I've noticed this with clients. I've also noticed this with myself. When I am stressed, I do tend to crave more carbohydrates. Sure. Now, the problem is when I eat them, I tend to want more of them. Um, and so then there's that factor too. Sure. Uh, what are your trigger foods? And yeah. uh, maybe low carb works better for you because carbohydrates make you want to eat. Way, uh, way more. I mean, maybe it's not, maybe it's not low carb. Maybe now you're messing with carb timing. Okay. Right? And, Good and idea. so now yeah. maybe, now maybe, maybe we're optimizing carb intake. So if you're 200 grams, you might have to have 50 grams pre-workout, 50 intra, 50 post, and then 50 before bed. So mm -hmm. you don't have, right? Like you don't have the option. That way you don't more. have, you're not going to eat a bunch right? of You're food. not going to get up in the middle of the night. Yeah. And if you do, like that's a whole another set of problems yeah, that we yeah. have to address. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think there's ways to circumvent that. But like when I start looking at the physiological adaptations, because again, I, I believe the physical follows mm -hmm. the physiological. And so if I'm setting you up to physiologically fail, then physically we're not going to be able to create what you right. want. Right. Um, and we could use an extreme example too, like a UFC fighter. Mm -hmm. I like, you know, I, I worked with, like I had three knockouts last year, which was awesome, right? Like three people that I work with. And ultimately like when they're in there, hydration is going to matter most, like the ability to rehydrate, but the ability to make weight on the scale is eh, I, that whole industry is fucking it up. Isn't it yeah. insane? It's absurd yeah. the shit that would come my Isn't way. Isn't the real game trying to be able to maintain like whatever weight that they're at, you know, going into well, the, the weight or? This last, so I worked with Luke Sanders when he knocked out Hen and Brow last year, right? And that was, that was a big deal because he had just come off a cut. That was our third camp together. And right before that, he had worked with, uh, perfecting athletes who is the ones that like Joanna hates because that's when she got knocked out by Rose. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember actually Andy Galpin was texting me, uh, as Luke was going through it. Cause I've been friends with him for a long time. He's like, yo, your boy's getting fucked over. Like he's just kind of like, he's hurting. Like, and, and then the next night he fought and whatever they do in terms of rehydration, it was terrible. Um, because he got clipped with like a looping punch that probably wouldn't have knocked any of us out. And it fucking sent him down mm. and the ref yeah. called the fight and it was a shitty loss for him. He shouldn't have lost that guy. Like I'm sure that guy's probably lost his contract by now. Luke's way better than that. And uh, like, so we did it. And, and so this last one, it was great, right? Like we worked with, like you met Josh Cuthbert, like mm -hmm. Josh did the strength and conditioning for him. I did the weight and then perfect or uh, Neuroforce one in Scottsdale did some of his conditioning. And it was, it was beautiful, but Neuroforce came to me like three weeks out and they're like, Hey, don't you think his weight's a little high? And I'm like, no. I'm like, I need Luke training at the same weight he's going to be in the cage. Mm -hmm. And like if, if, and he likes to fight at 54, he has to weigh in at 35. And so I keep him as close to like 52 to 54 as I can. And then the last three weeks I'll start bringing him down. But this was the first time I was able to go to his strength coaches and his conditioning people and say, Hey, listen, I'm going to bring his carbohydrates down for two to three days. I need you to back the fuck off the training intensity. Mm. 
Because if they're ready to put their foot on the gas and I'm ready to pull my foot that's, off that's in terms a bad of fuel, yeah. it's a really yeah. it's a recipe for disaster. But these fighters, they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. They're they're trained to fucking run yeah, through do a brick wall, do. Yeah. right? So all of a sudden, their strength coach is like, more, more, like get in the sweatsuit, like run, run, and it's like. No, like go fucking sleep. Now they took the rehydrating with the IVs. They took out, that out. Right? Thank yeah. God. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's made weight cutting a little safer. Um, you still just nature of the industry, man. Like somebody, you know, gets knocked out of a fight like two weeks out, and they're like, they call someone. They're like, hey, can you make weight? Well, yeah, you can make weight. Like you can suffer it. Mm -hmm. um, if people saw some of the shit that happens, they'd be blown away. Oh, I've seen I've seen guys lose yeah, twenty I feel pounds for these fighters, I've seen, man. I've seen people lose twenty pounds in one day. Yeah, in the one sauna. day, one day. Yeah, no well, way, dude. We purposefully no, you so, would, you so could Luke, probably do it. it. It would kill you, but you, yeah, you, could, you could lose twenty it. pounds. Yeah, you could do it easy. Right. So Bro, look, you look are at how, sweating. You're you're not drinking. You're like, pissing. I mean, you're talking to somebody who's manipulated hours. weight like crazy and know that I could gain twenty in a day. But the problem with it is like a lot of these idiot people that come into the space that think oh weight cutting is super simple yeah. they look at like water myopically yeah, like right. water in water out right yeah. or, or like not what i'm doing hormonally long term for there's, this person well, yeah but there's four ways to manipulate water in the yeah. body too like you don't have to just go start sweating right, right. right? there's four different like i mean well, there's four pathways that i for, use yeah, yeah i use i use total intake like i use carbohydrate i use total water intake i use electrolytes and then i use sweat yeah and if you do it right like this last camp dude we cut in 90 minutes we cut seven pounds the night before the fight in, in, 90, in, 30, minutes. in 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Wow. Wow. Right? That's great. I mean, the fucking week was, I mean, dude, now, the stars the, aligned. But easy. Beautiful. You figure for, for every yeah. carbohydrate, your body, for every uh, three uh, three grams of carbs, your body holds on to three ounces of water. It's every gram of carbs is 2.7 water. Right. Yep. So if you've, if you've done, if you've actually done a really good job of keeping his water up exactly. high and his carbohydrate intake really good, you could, I could, I used to be able to move my weight like that because I would keep it really good and healthy all the way. So then when I wanted to, throttle down that last week i can make just a few adjustments oh, and make moves like that for so sure so we're starting 10 days out right like we're water loading we're shutting off aldosterone we're shutting off adh yeah. right then we're moving carbs like we pull the carbs out because when aldosterone and adh are shut off you're not reabsorbing right you're not reabsorbing water so now you then you pull the carbs out right you pull the carbs out there's no water reabsorption so when the carbs are out uh any water they were holding moves with it that's the initial drop right then you still got the super high water. Now we remove the electrolytes, right? So any sodium that was holding the water, now more water's out. Then like last, like the day before, we bring the water out. Like aldosterone and ADH are still out, so you're not reabsorbing, but nothing's coming in. So now you're dropping more water. And then finally, because you're fucking hydrated, right? Like your body, like, you know, you're, you still had water coming in, so you still have water to sweat out you'll crack instantly in the sauna. So if you ever watch those guys, like they're they're rubbing sweet sweat everywhere. They can't they can't uh, they can't crack. And it's because they cut their fucking water 40 48 to 72 hours out and it's like you ain't got no fucking water in you to move. Yeah. Like like you've sent signals to your body not to sweat for natural survival. You know how dangerous that is too Man. to go into a sauna yeah, and not sweat. I don't I don't care how much abilene you got. The shit ain't coming out. <laughs> now what so, does that stuff do by the way? What is that that Man, that sweet I, I wish I knew. Yeah, I wish that? I knew the mechanism. It can't be good. <laughs> I I know that like you it, rub it on and well, you especially when you're already, you're sending a conflicting yeah, signal internally through. to your body saying don't fucking sweat. Exactly. And then you're trying to rub the yeah. shit. <laughs> well, I, I mean, ask the bikini girls. They fucking rub it on their abs like every oh. day, and then they they put the, like the little waist trainer oh, on, and they're man. like, look how much water came is there space? Is, is like, mind pump not helping? Oh, yeah, Are we, yeah. we not? We haven't made <laughs> any, is, not is the space not getting yet. better they're at not, all? They're not listening. Yeah, they're not. They're, they obviously think you guys are bullshit or something. But no, now the the one macronutrient that seems to be consistent regarding regardless of fat loss or muscle gain is protein. Yep. I mean, studies show high protein levels for fat loss diets. It's better for satiety, so you're full. Uh, it, it preserves more muscle. It seems to reduce the metabolic adaptation that happens mm -hmm. when you reduce calories. When you're bulking, high protein builds more muscle. Yeah. Um, are there ever cases where that's not good? Is there ever situations where you're working with clients and you're like, look, I know – Typically, we want high protein, but for you, I think we should probably cut it down. I think I think that you always have a, a goal of where you want protein, and then you got to look at how life gets in the way, um, or you got to look at where they're coming from. Like, I'm not going to take someone that comes to me, and, and you'd be shocked. Well, maybe you wouldn't be, but like some of the intakes I get, it's 30 grams of protein. Yeah. Like, like, like People are like, they ate 30 grams That's of protein. That's actually way more, we used <laughs> to have this hard. debate on Mind Pump a lot because we yeah. talked about the bodybuilding space, which I think is way different mentality than the average consumer. And- 
I most my female clients were grossly under eating yeah. protein. Which oh, yeah. re, this reminds me too of a another point that we were talking about being able to burn fat and build muscle and how rare it is. This is another case where sometimes you see this if somebody was grossly under eating protein yep. for a long period of time and just simply by bumping their protein intake and the fact that you're adding weights into their routine, yep. you see this kind of b bump of muscle. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, then we could go down that rabbit hole deeper and obviously we're we're living in the game changers time right now where, you know, veganism and vegetarianism is being really promoted, right? <laughs> and so, so a lot of people are really if they're following that. And, and unfortunately I have seen a lot of people in the space jump on that bandwagon. And, um, I don't, I think it might've been you guys like the The one benefit that I think actually came from that was like, at least people are eating plants again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Sal, you There's said it, right? like, like, there was a, there was a benefit, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like we can sit here and we can all get on our high horse and be like, we know veganism is not the way, but like, at the end of the day, there's there's more emphasis on people eating quality foods. I don't think it's that bad, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like we look at these people and it's like, if I could get you to consume 15 to 20 grams of, of essential aminos and, and maybe like five to 10 grams of branch chains with that diet, I bet you'd start to see, even in a small calorie deficit, I'm, I think you'd start to see some lean uh, That is the one population that benefits from branch amino acids yep. and essential amino acids supplements. Exactly. Supplement. People who are in the low protein uh, exactly. diet uh, community. So if you're a vegan, vegetarian, uh, if your protein intake is not, you know, maybe, you know, half a gram per pound of body weight at least, that's when you see the benefit. In fact, it's that's the only the, time that's that only I ever time. really prescribe it. And, and studies actually show it. Studies show you give BCAAs to somebody who has low protein intake and they get great results. You give it to a guy with high protein intake, it does nothing. Doesn't, it doesn't do shit. It does nothing at all. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I, anytime I've ever prescribed it before, it's been more on like the performance continuum because there were some studies that came out with like a, like with leucine that showed like a, a reduction in rate of perceived exertion and an increase in time to exhaustion. And it had nothing to do with muscle, right? Like mm -hmm. it was never about lean tissue acquisition. It was just like, hey, there may be a small performance benefit. So like, that's like when I used to dose leucine, um, like via just BCAAs, like I never have people do leucine alone. But um, you know, what your, your question was like on, on the protein intake. Like, yeah. Like, is it ever, do you ever have people taking less? Is I, it maybe I don't, digestive I don't intentionally. Or? Yeah. I mean, if your gut's fucked up, yeah, we're mm -hmm. going to have to back off. Um, also, I mean, if, if I've got somebody that's, and this is a rare population, but really pers like pursuing, um, a lot of muscle gain and they're like, you know, in an extended off season and they've just got a super fast metabolism. Um, I mean, I just, I can't, give a 200 pounder, 600, 700 grams of protein. Now, <laughs> I, ironically, like I just, like I literally just landed before this podcast and on the way over here, I was listening to Ben Pack's podcast with uh, Milos and, oh, yeah. and uh, they so were true. talking about Milos's training journals and Milos was talking about how he never, like he's got it documented in journals, never one day in his competitive career did he consume less than 450 grams of protein. Yeah. And, and he was sitting down with Nasser uh, and the late and, Nasser. Yeah. The late Nasser. Right. And Nasser was like, yeah, right. You're crazy. But he's like, if you're doing 450, I better do 550. And, and he actually like, he thought Milos was bullshitting him. So Nasser only ended up eating like 250 grams mm -hmm. for like a while. And he's like, oh, Milos tell me all the wrong stuff to screw me over. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, you know, high protein got vilified for a little while and I, it's just the nature of our industry. Like it, I believe everything is cyclical. Um, you know, right now, I think you're finally starting to see keto fade a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like it's finally moving through. There's an understanding around it. So, you know, what are we in 2020? In 2030, it's going to get hot again, mm -hmm. right? It, it'll go away. High carbohydrate diets will get popular. Everyone's going to be like, I can eat my fucking carbs again. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have to look at context because a high protein diet in the context of a lot of inflammation and a lot of calories. So yes. let's say an unhealthy diet that's high calorie, high protein could be a, a cancer driver. It 100%. could contribute to other health problems, but so could carbohydrates in the same context or excess fats in the same context. So sometimes I look at studies and I, and I read them and it's like people with high you know, fat intake have this, this, and that, but then you notice that, oh, they're all high calorie consumers and the, none of them are exercising and they have a poor diet. And well, I could look at any macronutrient under those circumstances. I think you bring up a really good point too in the sense that anytime we bring up a dietary uh, protocol, right? Anytime we talk about proteins, carbs, fats, calories, it, there's automatically this assumption that it applies to body composition, mm -hmm. right? Everybody, like you hear the word diet, you instantly think body composition, mm. body fat loss, muscle gain. And there's a whole continuum of things that we need to be looking at relative to our diets, how we feel, our health status, our, you know, uh, our longevity, like all of these things that, that don't relate to just how you look. Um, 
And so, you know, and like, I, I mean, you asked about protein. I mm -hmm. mean, immediately my assumption went to lean tissue, mm. right? And, and then you bring that up and it's like, no, you're a hundred percent right. Um, you know, somebody that's, that potentially that has cancer or is going through treatments, like, no, I'd probably be backing off to mm. be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you start looking at like the types of, of protein inside of a specified situation like that, right? Like there's, you know, most common source of protein, a lot of people is chicken breast, right? And you start looking at, okay, well, that's predominantly omega-6 fats. So now we're creating a pro-inflammatory effect in someone that's got cancer and, well, that's a pretty shitty way to prescribe to somebody. Sure, sure. Right? So there's a, there's a lot of areas that have to be considered that I just, again, it's a, it's a much deeper investigation. Well, I think we're somewhere where we, we all strongly agree is no matter what your goal is, whether it's fat loss or muscle building, the first thing, and, and it's probably weeks, maybe months, which that's my question for you is how long you think it normally is, you should be focused mainly on getting healthy. Yeah. And figuring all that out yeah. uh, before you go any direction or yeah. try to go any direction, and that should be your main focus. Now, uh, to that point, and we all agree on that. What What do you think is most common, uh, and how long do you do you normally spend with somebody like this with, from taking them? And I know, of course, this depends yeah. on you know how fucked up they were yeah. when you got them. You know, yeah. but what's kind of a range look like normally? Yeah, I mean that's. I would love to give you like a, a typical range. Unfortunately, for a long time, like I was, you know, you guys, like, like around the time I was talking about it and you guys, and there was a couple other people in the industry that were brave enough to actually say this shit. Um, there's a marketing component that comes into this where trainers don't want to go to their clients that are overweight and say, hey, I can't help you lose weight yet mm -hmm. um, because I need to fix you. And, and they're afraid they're going to lose money. Right. And new coaches can't afford to lose money. They got to they got to they gotta take money. Um, so I think it takes a coach that's really secure in who they are and, and really secure in like the big picture of business first off, right? Like that has to be acknowledged in, in this space. Um, you know, second, uh, a person knows how fucked up they are, right? So if it's like, if you really didn't know you were doing shit wrong by being in extreme calorie deficit and you really haven't seen the effects, a lot of times it's pretty quick, man. A couple weeks, four, six weeks max, right? Um, a lot of times there's no adaptation that's even been created. And by actually providing like what you said, Sal earlier, by providing uh, the right amount of calories, which is an increase in calories, you actually start seeing results. Um, I wrote a blog one time on reverse dieting and I was like, there's three, there's three responses. You, you know, you either gain weight cause you're adding in calories and you've adapted to low calorie state. Uh, you don't gain weight, but your biofeedback gets better. That's not terrible. Um, or you're like, you're, you're the lucky one that makes your coach look really good. You're a hyper responder and you start losing weight right away. Uh, the law, like that was written two, three years ago. The longer I've been around that, I realize it really comes down to two factors, duration, um, and, and like the degree of the adaptation. So like how long have you been in a metabolically adapted space in that adapted state? And what was the, like the degree of what you were doing that got you to that adapted state? Um, and really those are the two factors that are going to mitigate the, the process of, of the length creating of health yeah. status yeah. before we begin a diet. And that goes into the whole, like losing fat and building muscle. It's like in an ideal scenario, if you came to me today and you're at ground zero, like we could probably get a significant amount of fat off in 12 weeks. And then we could probably reverse you out pretty quick and then focus on building muscle. I want to get back into like the muscle building component of yeah. this whole conversation and like talk about, so you do bring somebody back to this homeostasis. You, they're in a healthy place, but now like you're, you're taking them through like the bulking phase. Sure. What does that look like in terms of the amount of calories, like something, a typical client you have, like trying to guide them through that and whether or not it's, it's, you know, consistently throughout or you're doing it intermittently. Like mm -hmm. what does that look like? So I think um, this is, again, it has to, you got to look at what is the personality of, of the person. So initially, like Adam, when you came out of a competition prep and you're like going in the off season, like you're, you, you're very strong mentally, but the average person, they're like, oh, it's off season time. I get to fucking eat everything. And right. like you give them a protocol and, and let's say it's a protocol that's like pretty calorically uh, in a surplus. But you also have to know that this person is probably going to have a propensity to eat off that plan. So let's just say you're estimating your daily energy expenditure to be 3,000. You decide to put them in a calorie surplus of 1,000. So you're giving them 4,000. You have to know that inherently this person's probably going to be consuming closer to 5,000, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. like adjusted for weekly average intake based on how many times they're going to deviate. 
uh, I don't think that's advisable at all, right? That's a recipe for a lot of fat gain, not mm-hmm. a lot of muscle gain. And, right. and remember, your your body has a certain range where it's most efficient, right? Where once you step outside of that, you're, you're gaining more fat than you're gaining muscle. Um, so I, I, I'm a little bit of a slower approach guy myself, um, but I'm... I don't even want to necessarily speak to speed as much as it is sustainability. Like I, I don't want, if your goal is to build muscle and then you're going to look in the mirror two weeks later and be like, Oh my God, I'm fat. And now you feel like you want to cut. That's a problem in and of itself. So, you know, I guess the questions I would then turn around and ask are why, why are we building muscle? Right. Is it for a stage? Is it just for life? Is it for strength? Mm-hmm. Like, like what is the purpose is, is there a time that like we need to have this muscle built? Say by, it's just this person that wants to just wants know, to get bigger, right? Like and lean though at the same time. Right. So then we're going to put you in a super small deficit or a super small surplus, which right. by the way, like, like longevity says you should be in a super small deficit, but from a super small surplus and then accounting for life, like I'm talking like 200 to 300 calories. Oh, it's surplus. a real small deficit. Very small surplus, right? Or sur- surplus. Yeah, too. very small surplus. But then you factor in life. Mm-hmm. Date night happens, couple drinks happen. Right. And now look at like the weekly adjusted surplus. But you're you're going in there as a coach knowing that. So I'm saying, going in there knowing that. That's yeah. It's not a prescription based on what's physiologically correct. Now, is this something yeah. that you teach your coaches also? Oh, say, 100%. Hey, oh, so this is, part of the, this is all part of the conversation. See, well, yeah. this is why we like you guys because yeah. that makes perfect sense because if you don't don't account for what's probably going to happen, mm-hmm. then your recommendation plus you know life is going to add up to too big yeah. of a surplus. Well, you don't get to live in a fantasy world, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like we can live in the lab all day. The lab isn't where life takes place, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like we step out of here and fucking life hits us mm-hmm. and, and you never know what's going to happen. Well, that's you got to be ready to account for that's it. That's the problem of the the coaches and trainers and people that that, that purely speak from the the scientific studies mm-hmm. that that are with these small control groups and then that they they get their their direction purely from that. It's like there's so many other things that you have to account for that yeah. have nothing well, to do with that. Part, I mean, part of it's experience, uh, but luckily again, like you you guys are teaching people the right way. It's like, "Hey, look, um Here's what it says on paper. You want them at a 400 to 500 calorie surplus. But here's what happens in real life. You put them on a 200 calorie surplus because they're going to mess up a few times during the mm-hmm. week, which is going to come out to yeah. about yeah. a 500 calorie surplus. Yeah, like when you start creating that weekly adjustment, it, it does. And and then, yeah, it is experience, man. I mean, I, you know, it, again, like we can't expect the general population to act with the you know like the level of of being strict as like a competitor would or as somebody of like a lab right you can't expect the general population to to have their actions align with lab controlled settings Mm -hmm. it just it's not going to ever happen Mm -hmm. like now now i want to i want to talk to you about some of the athletes you work with because this gets real fun athletes are much more controlled fun yeah (laughs) they actually do everything we have they have yeah i mean they have to or they're going to get their butts kicked or whatever um, what, what have you noticed because you've worked with quite a few mm-hmm. and some at very, very high levels. What have you noticed tend to be like better sources of carbs in terms of performance? Cause you can get carbohydrates, for example, from a lot of different sure. sources, but are there sources that you find seem to just work better for most of your, your, your athletes? So here's the crazy part that maybe a lot of people would never have considered. The answer is yes, there are like, and they're, they're all whole foods, right? So like sweet potatoes, white rice are, are staples, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I live in those and. But that being said, as the season wears on, I get a lot looser in terms of my like like what I'll allow for carbs. Oh, so let's use like let's use like George Kittle, right? He's NFC championship this weekend. Yeah. I, like when him and I first talked right before the season, it was like I wanted high molecular weight carbs post workout. He's an athlete. Like I understand there's no like benefit to muscle in that window. Like we could Let's just end that debate. Sure, right? Faster it's, a, it's a nervous system response. And That's now, what, what, what is high molecular weight carbohydrates? So, like, uh, like some like rapidly absorbed carbs, right? So, go. I'm, I'm like talking about like uh, I, I, I use highly branched cyclic dextrin. Okay, and and that's a hundred percent a CNS issue, right? Like you're you're coming out of a, a sympathetic training session. I'm trying to create that parasympathetic shift and get you into that as like, fast recovery. as possible. It has absolutely nothing to do with the anabolic window. Like mm. like we could end that right. So I, before people are like, oh, Jason talked about the anabolic window. No, yeah. I didn't say shit. About no, what that. you're saying makes perfect sense. And these are these are carbs that just fast gastric emptying yes. absorbed in the system very quickly. Yeah. And especially for a guy like him, where he struggles to eat anyway. And most mm-hmm. athletes, you'd be surprised, yeah. struggle to eat enough. Maybe yeah. you wouldn't, right? It's uh, especially like their their needs. We're talking four or five thousand calories, sometimes more. What is it? 
guy like him, like a pre, uh, like what is he eating like before his main competition? So my advice with somebody like him is three hours out of the competition. I'm getting in like what I, what I say to him is a complete meal, a protein source, a carbohydrate source, and like a vegetable and, and a fat source. Right. That's what I want. Everything. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, now I don't want like extreme hunger going in, but I want a little bit of hunger. Right. And so, uh, now, why now, do you want a little bit of hunger going into the so game? So when, when hunger starts to rise, it's a physiological signal that cortisol is starting to rise, right? I want that slight cortisol elevation. Why? It triggers sympathetic nervous system. It gives you energy, man. I want that fight or flight, yeah. right? And then this goes back to the whole dietary, like nutritional periodization. I know 100% that I'm intentionally leveraging cortisol in a season. Mm-hmm. That shouldn't happen in like real life, real health no, scenario. totally different. You don't want that. Right. But I fucking want it. Like Mm -hmm. you're playing in the Super Bowl. I want you on a cortisol drip. I want every ounce of nervous system strength and physical strength that you have for those three hours that you're playing the damn game. Because now I got it. Now I got three (laughs) months to like, (laughs) yeah, he is going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to destroy Green Bay. Yeah. I'm betting that way. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't even think it's close. (laughs) So So. why why do you get looser with? So I get looser because quantity becomes even more important. Uh, Right. So we've done such a good job in the off season of making sure that you're at that homeostatic balance, that you're in a position to perform early in the season. mm -hmm. But let's be honest athletes are a little lazy right like when it comes to nutrition mm-hmm. they're they'll fucking train their asses oh, off they'll play their ass off yeah and they think that they can get by without maximizing this and so towards the end it's like hey you need a bowl of cereal at night like go ahead and have three right mm-hmm. and and you need you know you need some carbs Magic in the morning for that. like you need to throw <laughs> some honey in there and yeah. like you need to throw like a little extra sugar in there like go do what you got to do awesome. and so as as it gets on like it's it's, it's not health right Infl- inflammation's already happening. Like, like those things are already present. Of course we want to control them, but they're doing a lot of physical recovery modalities. My whole goal at that point is, is uh, performance and recovery, nothing else. I don't give a fuck about your body fat levels. I don't give a fuck about your biomarkers. Like I don't give a shit about that. And that's what people don't understand. Like when I'm in season and I'm working with an athlete, whether it's a, an NFL player on the field, a UFC fighter in the cage, whatever your sport is, you paid me at the beginning to make yeah, sure that you perform your best, yeah. the end. You didn't tell me you want to get on the podium with abs, yeah. right? Yeah. right? You paid me to win, and and that's what we do. Now, afterwards, it's my obligation to say to you, hey, uh, we made some health sacrifices along the way. We need to get healthy so that next year we can do this shit again. Perfect. Mm-hmm. So you said you know, sweet potatoes, white rice, you notice seem to be very, very good. Those are my staples, of, man. Those probably because they're easy to digest. Are, and honestly, like steel cut oats in the morning. Yeah. Uh, I love cream of rice, honestly. Like I, I like oat bran and cream of rice mm-hmm. a little bit better. Um, what about grits? I I mean, I'll use them in a dietary thing okay. and uh, or like in a dietary Southern protocol, thing. but I've, I've not a fan of grits yeah, myself. Yeah. So, so, so the, and, and I, I worked with clients and some athletes and I find it's just easier to, to, to digest. Sure. That makes them better sources. What about sources of protein? Now bodybuilders for a long time have been, have said how red meat is phenomenal uh, source of protein, especially in the off season, because on a gram for gram basis, they still get more strength gains. I think it has to do with the creatine content of red meat. Mm-hmm. Or the have cholesterol. You, yeah. Have you noticed any think, any differences between protein sources for athletes? When we when we start looking at the old school like bodybuilders that said like they get more strength from red meat, I think calorie for calorie, an ounce of red meat is just higher. Mm. Right. And and back in the day, like how were diets set up? Well, in the beginning of the diet, you eat more red meat, you eat more carbohydrate. Yeah. And then over the course of the diet, well, you remove carbs from meal five. Or you switch your red meats to white meats, or you sm- or you switch your white meats to white. That's fish, how they got their right. Like that's that's how they did it. That's they, how they dropped their calories. Yeah, that's how they dropped calories. So I, I really think it was just a, a calorie for calorie okay. thing, or a, a fat like a, a gram of fat per gram of fat thing. Um, I, I'm definitely a big fan of red meat. I mean, honestly, like when you start looking at the ratio of fats, the, the fats in red meat are healthier. Mm-hmm. Um, we see less inflammation from red meat, uh, better amino acid profile from red meat. Um, and, and again, when we're looking at caloric density of a person who doesn't like to eat a lot, I, I'd love to use red meat. Do you ever use uh, organ meats with your with your athletes? I, I don't only because and, and not because the, it wouldn't work and it wouldn't be a great source of protein. But I'm also talking to people who either are hiring a chef or who are literally like, what is the minimal amount of time I can spend getting yeah. my shit together. Yeah. And they're like, not going to want to eat liver. They don't, yeah, they don't get a fuck. Now <laughs> they want burgers I worked with, uh, I worked with Solomon Hill who, uh, I don't fucking know what team he's playing for now, but I worked with him when he was with the Pelicans and, uh, he had a chef 
And his chef would be like, tell me exactly like what's going to be best and, and I'll put it together. Now he happened to be vegan, but, um, so like we were always, you know, we were always trying to like circumvent that. But, yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, every now and then, uh, actually, do you guys know Dan Henry, the internet marketer? Mm -mm. Um, he's a, he's a big time internet marketer guy. He just reached out to me last week and he's like, I'll hire a chef and you tell that chef like the best possible thing. Yeah, that's he's cool. like, all I want to be is jacked and ripped. And I'm like, cool dude, <laughs> that's like, like we can do it. Client. Yeah. So yeah, no. And yeah. like, and he has got the money to be able to do it. So that's great. Uh, yeah. So like we just, that's connected fun. Last week. No. Yeah. Like I, that's like, fun. I love things right, like right, that. Cause like, then you could use it as an I experiment. get really excited yeah. on, on ones like that, but you know, it's, I don't know how you guys feel about this. Like, you know, as, as you guys sort of, you were in the industry, like in the trenches for like a long time. Now you kind of get to observe the industry every now and then I, I really get this itch to like, to get back in the industry and to like, to do it with like a small number of people. Well, I think that we all do that. I I've got, I've got two people I'm talking to yeah. that are family yeah. friends. I always train one client. It's I just, just reopened a coaching funnel yeah. to, to take on like yeah. 20 to 30 clients, like yeah. max. Now I do, I do everything calls. through, I do everything through text message, yeah. right? Like, so I work super closely with my people. So like, you know, if you work with me, you're getting a hundred percent of me, but yeah. I, uh, yeah, like I, I just, I get these itch. Well, it reminds to, to for me it. too. It's about, because I do, I, nothing I love more than doing what we do now. I mean, I just, I love the podcast and what it, what it does, but I, I, getting to train clients reminds me of the questions they ask. Yes. And, and so that just makes better content here. Just, it's oh, like, it's your pulse on the industry. It keeps you, it keeps you grounded. Yeah. You know, the, the, if, if I'm not working with people or working out in gyms or managing gyms or working with trainers. Or I, I start to feel like I float off the ground and, you know, I'm speaking on this podcast out to the internet. Um, it's not the same thing. I think it's an important thing that you, you should do, especially if you're communicating it. Well, and I mean, how do you know what the industry trends are? I mean, you yeah. could read the media, but like, how do you know how clients are responding, how they're experiencing it, mm -hmm. how they're, you know, how it's affecting them? Because again, uh, you know, we go back to like the scientific studies and, and the academia world. And I, I love how you came out and you were like, you had issues with like the academia oh, world. Yeah. Like I, I actually, <laughs> that was so like shit. that shit. And I know you got so much shit for that, but like, I loved when you came out because you're one of the, like, you're one of the most intelligent, actually, like you came to the event and everyone's like, Sal is really wise. Like that was the word everyone used for you. Right. But like, it's you true. Like you, owl. you, you can interpret scientific studies and extrapolate what you need, but you're also able to look at real life and say, okay, like we don't live in a fucking incubator. Mm -hmm. Like we don't live in a lab. Like we, we live in this beautiful thing called a world where great things take place that are not always in line with scientific studies. And, uh, you know, I think you have to have the scientific knowledge. You have to know what's happening, but you, more importantly, you got to understand the human being that you're yeah. trying to help, man. Like at the end of the day, uh, we, we could talk about any topic and I'm going to still try and bring it back to the human being because the, I don't know, millions of people will download this episode of the podcast, but each one is going to be in a car, in the gym, they got their hair, their, their headphones on, on a plane. Right. And they're one person and they're listening to it with one application and they're living their unique life and their unique circumstances and they want their unique result. And if you don't know how to take all this information in your head and you don't know how to apply it to that situation or you can't help them apply it to that situation, like you as a coach, you suck. Yeah. Like well, bottom line, well, you look, suck. You, you, if you go back, you know, a hundred years and you ask scientists then and you said, hey, you know, what do you think would happen if all of us all of a sudden had access to all of recorded human history? They would have said, oh, it would have been a utopia. All of our problems would have been solved. Well, here we are, and the problems are still here. Yeah. And so, and what we're realizing is it's not an information problem. It's a wisdom problem. And being able to communicate fitness and nutrition and health um, is extremely important. And nine out of 10 times, it's not your ability to recite factual information. Nine out of 10 times, be able to relate and be able to communicate the right information and communicate it the right way. And that took me 10 years. It took me 10 years as a personal trainer to figure out. It took me a long time. Well, and I knew these guys echo the same yep. thing. Well, it's funny. I had a conversation with a girl. Um, one of like my, uh, the, the guy that does my email blast, he sent one out yesterday and he was like, hey, like, what do you want to know from me? And, and all these people responded. And this one girl was like, I need to know how to get clients and do this. And, and I like, I wrote her back and I told her about like how we help businesses. And I'm like, I'd be happy to get on a call and help you out. She's like, yeah, like I just like, I just invested in this other like mentorship, which is all information. And I'm like, and, and the, there's this, these coaches like, like, listen, everyone needs a certification. Everyone needs to get certified and have their shit, right? The problem with you helping people isn't because you don't know enough. Either you're not confident enough in yourself or you haven't figured out how to connect with the person, understand what they truly need. 
And and those are things that you have to get in the trenches for and, and you have to learn to live and you got to start looking at human beings and stop trying to look for like cases. And, and that's where, um, that's where I just, that's the separation between great coaches and, and good coaches. It's, it's a different, that's why we, that's why we chose to work with you. There's a lot of nutritional courses and certifications out there. Um, but they, for us, they would leave, they would, you know, they would leave us thinking like this is just not this is not really giving people coaches the tools that they really need to be successful and i think you guys focus on that uh yeah it, it, it make it a priority that's a, i mean I, I shared with you guys how the whole thing came to be right how i built the nutritional coaching institute mm. so i was i was at an event in uh southern california as a as a mastermind and uh fuck your mastermind by the way right like <laughs> i gotta get you guys to like wear those shirts out i, I, I gave those guys we should have worn today i, didn't I, know, I thought about wearing mine here and i yeah. was like ah that's gonna look weird going through the airport but, <laughs> um but yeah no so it's uh i was at an event and uh this really well-known internet marketer was like dude like you, you're helping so many people but like you're it's it's your method that's that's really good right it's not just you and uh he's like you need to you need to build a certification and I was like, I'm like, it's the nutrition industry. Everyone knows who the gold standard nutrition certification is. I'm like, I can't compete with them. And, and, uh, he's like, no, like you have something special. You need to find it and you need to do it. And he was like adamant and uh, is somebody I really respected. And I was like, okay. So I, I got my car and I was driving from SoCal at the time I was living in Arizona and I got halfway home and it hit me. Like it was like a ton of bricks hit me right in the face. And I was like, it's like, you're really good at connection and application. And like everything got so clear in that instant. I drove the rest of the way home, left my shit in my car, ran to my desk, opened up a journal, wrote out the whole outline of what the course was. It was like part one, science, all the topics, part two, application, all the topics. And I never deviated. Like that was the shit we put in version one of the course. And like, that's the shit that we continue to teach. And like, I knew right then that's why I was successful. That's why we had built what we had built, but also how literally millions of people mm. can become successful with it. And, uh, how many coaches have you guys certified? Man, we've put over 3000 through at this point. Good for um, you. and we're, right. we'll be three years old in July. Uh, wow. That's great. Yeah. So we, uh, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty young in the space, but I think that you're starting. My favorite part is we're getting a lot of people from our competitor. Um, and they're coming and they're saying you filled in the gap. And that was exactly what we aimed to do. Right. Like, like we, like you said, people finish the certification and they, they feel like they don't have exactly what they need. And we said, no, like we're going to give you what you need to go out. And, um, well, you know, our, our models evolved, right? Like in the beginning, it was like, I, I had a level one course and then I'm like, cool. Like if you want, you can take these other courses. Now I look at what we do a little more as a trade school, right? If you don't need to go to, to college and, and pay for extra science degree and, and you certainly don't need to become an RD, right? But you don't need to be 50, 60, $70,000 in debt right? We have, we have an institute. It is designed to take you from zero knowledge to like scaling a business because we do have a business course as well, right? Like, I'm sorry, coaches out there, if you don't understand business, you're not going to have impact. Oh my gosh. World. You could have, you could be the best trainer coach exactly. in the world. But if you don't understand how to, how to run your business, you're screwed. So, so we have all those, man. It's literally designed to take you from, from that startup to, to ultimately scaling your business. And, uh, Man, like we've got some dope stories. Like uh, I'm doing a webinar tonight and like one of the testimonials I used, she sat in the very first cert ever in Chicago and her second year, like so last year is the second year that we were live. She made a quarter million dollars it's as awesome. a coach. Wow. She had no awesome. fucking traditional knowledge. Wow, good for her. That's exceptional. It was it was unreal, man. And like those are the stories that just get me super well, hyped. And what do you think about? Uh, I know some some countries are talking about regulating coaches and trainers yep. through the government. And I know there's been some talk about that here in the U.S., uh, which I think would be a complete disaster. That's my own opinion. What do you think about that? What do you think about? a federal kind of nationalized standards for coaches and trainers? I mean, I guess we kind of have one in the RD sense. Like you can't write a diet unless sure. you're an RD. Um, yet I've had RDs come through my course and say they learned more in 48 hours about really helping people than they did in four years of an internship. Mm. Um, I, I think it would give a lot. It would. There's obviously benefits to it, and I understand why. But in typical like bureaucratic fashion, they're gonna <laughs> fuck disaster. up. Like they're gonna fuck up the application, <laughs> totally. right? And they're gonna end up hurting a lot more people than they are helping yeah. people. Yeah. Um, so I, I I don't welcome it. That being said, I mean, if we're looking at it, you know, do you really need to be certified to give advice? 
And, and at the end of the day, as a coach, we can't put a gun to a client's head. Uh, we're just giving our best advice, right, right, right? right? As coaches, we're becoming advocates for our clients and, and we're looking out for their best interests and, and laying out what we believe to be the best route to success. At the end of the day, they have to follow it. Cool. And, and I don't think that the government is ever going to be able to regulate that. Good, so. good, good. Now, you, you're you hooking up our, our listeners yes. special yes. right now with this yeah. episode. I'm going to put you on the spot here. So what are they getting? What are they getting? This is not our normal NCI. No. So, so what we've done before for your listeners is we've done, you know, we did a scholarship. We selected somebody, we gave away all of our courses, which is a $10,000 value. Um, and we've given away some of our master classes, which mm -hmm. are $600 a piece. Uh, but I wanted to do something special to me. And like, you know, I, I came here like two years ago and, and I was early in like the evolution of my career and you, like you guys supported me and like, you know, I'm, I'm still fortunate enough to like text you guys. You just came to the event and like, that's super cool. and means more to me than you guys know. And so now I want to pay that forward to the millions of people that listen to you guys. And so, um, like I said, all of our courses, if, if somebody wants to do the Institute, it's a $10,000 investment. Um, I, I'm just going to wipe 70% for your followers and your listeners. Wow. And so I, I don't want to misquote the link, so I won't say it, but I'll let you guys put it in the show notes because okay. um, I need to check with my team. But it's literally, there's one link you have to go. Like if you go to my normal site, ncicertifications.com, everything's full price on there. Um, but if you guys go through the Mind Pump link, which you guys can post. We'll do it in the um, intro, I think. All right, yeah, do it in the intro. That'd be dope. But if you guys go through that link, there's a video. You just simply, you know, you apply, you tell me like, hey, I, I heard this on Mind Pump. Um, within a day, my team will reach out to you and instantly give you 70% off and uh, they'll do a payment plan. Like they'll work with you. Like we treat it like college. Like if you need to pay it over time, pay it over time. Like we really believe that this is the key to, if you want to create help and, and you really want to increase your knowledge, but really have that application to actually go out and create impact. Like we say impact over everything. Um, if you really want to go out and have that impact, man, like we know we have the resources. And so I'm super humbled to, to do that for you guys. Excellent. Thank awesome. you, man. Appreciate it. And thanks for coming on the show, brother. Dude, absolutely. Yeah. Appreciate you guys having Thank me here you. today. Oh, it was a great time.